Bible scriptures from um, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses from 16 to 20. The Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Can you hear me? Am I on? Yeah. So, we're going on a journey of discipleship. So enjoy the journey. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verse 13, He that endures to the end is the one that shall be saved. But I like to read it, He that enjoys to the end is the one that shall be saved. Let's enjoy together our journey of discipleship. Let me just uh, tell you what happened, what's happened to me in the last couple of days. So on Friday, um, I visited a friend. He's been struggling with a few things. And I said, let me take you out for a curry. It's amazing the healing properties in a curry. So he said, he's a work colleague I, I used to work with many, many years ago. And I said, let's, let's go for a curry, my treat. So he said, well, come and meet me at my parents' house, because he's, he's still living with his parents. So um, I said, I'll meet you at 5 o'clock. So, because I'm English, I turned up at just before 5, on time. And um, it was great. So um, the mother and the family, she made me a, a hot drink. And then the father came downstairs. And I just sensed there was something kind of a nervousness. There was a, a bit of an atmosphere. So I just said, uh, are you okay to the father? And he said, actually, no. He says, I've been losing weight quite rapidly. I've had all the medical tests. They can't find out what's wrong. He's had the camera down him. He's had all sorts of blood tests. And I was very daring. So this is a man who's not a believer. And I said to him, nervously, can I pray for you? And he said, pray for me. I said, yeah. He knows I'm a follower of Jesus. I said, can I pray for you? He says, please. So I just prayed for him in a gentle way. I thanked God for him. I, I, brought, God, I brought his name before God and his situation. I just prayed that God would resolve the situation, find out what was wrong with him, and that all would work out well in the end. In the name of Jesus, amen. And he goes, whoa. So this man is in his 70s. And he says to me, nobody has ever done that for me before, prayed for me. And I thought, whoa. So I said, keep in touch. Let me know what happens. So then I took my friend to his favorite Indian restaurant. And just a little tip, whenever you go to a restaurant, um, if you feel comfortable with it, before you eat your meal, when the food is brought to the table, say to the waiter or the waitress, you know, um, I'm a follow of Jesus, and I love to give thanks to my creator for the food, but can I pray for you also? Is there something that I can pray for you? And you have to use your sensitivity, because sometimes you go into restaurants, and they're so busy, they're rushing around like headless chickens, they probably wouldn't stop and let you pray for them. But I've done this on numerous occasions, and the, the, the best story I had is this waitress said to me, please pray for me, I've got cancer. And every time I went back to the restaurant, she came up to me and was giving me updates. And eventually she was free of cancer, praise God. So a little tip, when you're in a restaurant, you need sensitivity, but uh, if you feel comfortable with it, before you start your meal, say to the waiter, I'd love to pray for you. Is there anything I can pray for? So that was a great uh, Friday night. And then on Saturday, just gone, um, I was headed off for a, a Bible study group that I go to maybe once every five weeks. 
And as I was waiting for my bus to come, there was two Polish guys next to me come off their work shift, and uh, they had their cans of beer. Polish people seem to like their beer. And they were just talking away in Polish. Well, I don't understand Polish. But I thought, you know, my bus is coming soon. It's worth a try. So one of the words I do know in Polish is tak, which means yes. So when they were talking, they looked like they were moaning about something. And I just went, tak, tak. And they looked at me like I could understand everything. And I said, you know, I don't understand Polish. Uh, I'm actually English. Couldn't understand what you were talking about. And then one of the guys said, I was talking about me. I've got a medical problem. And I've been on the waiting list for an operation for two years. And I've been in so much discomfort. And that's what I've been moaning about. So I said, you know, trust God. Pray to God. And I knew my bus was coming. And I just happened to have some Bible literature, which I gave to this uh, Polish man who spoke very good English. And he was very, very thankful. And then my bus came and I had to go, so I wasn't able to pray for him. But I thought, wow, two Polish guys managing to talk about Jesus somehow. Incredible. And then, I love being a Christian. It is so exciting. You never know what your day will bring to you. Just fantastic. So then I arrive in Hanley. The bus was late. And normally this small Bible study group, what they do is they have a small breakfast, uh, coffee, toast, tea, stuff like that. And then for an hour, they discuss part of the Bible. And at the moment, they're looking through the miracles, the signs of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Well, my bus was late. I wasn't going to go to the breakfast, but I thought, hey, there's a Starbucks. I'll just pop in for a sneaky hot soya milk. I love hot soya milk at the moment. And as I'm having my hot soya milk, in my head, I see this Muslim man that I've not seen for months and months and months and months. And as I saw his head in my, uh, as I saw his face in my head, guess who walks around the corner? It's him. So he grabbed a coffee, he sat with me, and we were chatting, catching up with things. Not seen him for such a long time. And he says, uh, what are you doing here? I said, actually, I'm going to a small Bible group. We're meeting uh, 10, 10 minutes walk away, uh, just discussing the Bible. Would you like to come along? And he said, yes. So this young Muslim gentleman came to his first ever Bible study. And there's about 20 of us meeting in a group. And I just thought, whoa, I love being a Christian. And Jesus said, didn't he? We just read that. Verse 18 in Matthew 28, and Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Do you know God is on the move? Well, I think God's always on the move, but I think his people are starting to listen. And worldwide, the Spirit of God is moving on the hearts of church people and speaking to them about the issue of discipleship. It's moving beyond believing in God to actually walking in the, in the footsteps of Jesus, becoming more Christ-like and seeking to nurture other people in the Christian faith, growing together and growing others who will then grow others. Definition of the word disciple, got from Harper's Bible Dictionary, says the word disciple comes from the Greek word mathetus, meaning learner, apprentice, or adherent. It depicts a person whose mind is set on a purpose. It refers to an apprentice or pupil attached to a teacher or movement, one whose allegiance is to instruction and commitments of their teacher or movement. I love that. An apprentice or pupil attached to a teacher or movement, one whose allegiance is to instruction and commitments of their teacher or movement movement. Our allegiance should be Jesus. 
our focus should be on Jesus. And the church of Jesus Christ on this earth today, the body of Christ, is not a stagnant pond. It's a flowing river, a moving, flowing river. My question is, are you committed to Jesus and to his plan? Got some quotes about discipleship and things related with discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, hands up if you've heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Whenever, I don't know him personally, <laughs> but whenever I see pictures of, of him, he reminds me of Hair Flick that used to be in that program, Allo Allo, that comedy program. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Ooh, that's painful. Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Somebody said, spiritual maturity isn't measured by how high you jump in praise, but how straight you walk in obedience. And A.W. Tozer said, in relation to discipleship, he said, the spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. Wow. Discipleship. Change is difficult. I struggle with change. Um, I don't know about you, but I like the comfortable things. I like to be in the comfort zone. Um, but part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is about moving into the uncomfortable realm. But in that uncomfortable realm is great blessing. And it's part of God's plan for you and me. Discipleship is a brand new old teaching, a buried treasure that has been hidden for so long but has been rediscovered. Discipleship has always been there in the Bible, and discipleship has always been in the church. But over time, it's become like a treasure that's been buried away, and now the Holy Spirit is bringing it to the surface, and it's being rediscovered. At its core, discipleship is a relationship with Christ that is transforming, liberating, and empowering. It seeks to shape, mold, and motivate others to follow and imitate Jesus Christ too. God is in the multiplication business. Have you ever read the first chapter of the Bible? where God gives a commandment to mankind, to Adam and Eve, to go, to multiply, to fill the earth. Yeah? You remember that commandment? And isn't it interesting, all the unbelievers in the world, people that have never read the Bible, people that are not interested in God, it's one commandment they've always been good at, to become fruitful and to fill this earth. But God is in the multiplication business and expansion spiritually too. God wants to fill the earth with people that manifest the qualities and character of the kingdom of God and of Christ Jesus himself. Some of you may be familiar with the prophecies of Daniel. In, in Daniel chapter 2 verse 35, Daniel um, is explaining this uh, dream, this vision, where it talks about a rock that becomes a mountain which fills the whole earth. God is in the multiplication and expansion business. God wants a multiplied people that bear his image and character spread throughout all the earth. Now, I'm not a Hebrew and a Greek scholar, but it's always interesting to dig into the text of our Bible, its original languages, Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. Now, thankfully, God speaks to me in English, and you don't have to be a master scholar of uh, biblical languages to have a relationship with Jesus. But we can learn some helpful things from the text that Gita so kindly read to us earlier. 
Because we hear the Great Commission, don't we? Go, make disciples. And we so often emphasize the word go. But here's something interesting. So a guy called James Rich, who is a pastor and understands the Greek text, he says when explaining this text, the text that we read earlier, the one on the board, when explaining this text, many modern preachers and missionaries have keyed in on the English verb go, which clearly looks like a command. But, he says, is going the essence of the Great Commission? He goes on to say the Greek text helps us to get precisely at the point. Greek shows here there is only one main verb, which is the imperative or the command. So the actual commission is make disciples. The commanding aspect of that text isn't so much go, although we should be going, but the command is to make disciples. The Greek also shows that the sole main verb is accompanied by three other action words. These action words help to further define and explain the circumstances and means which accompany the action of the main verb. So in the Greek, it teaches us that the central action which fulfills the Great Commission is to make disciples. But we also understand that the action is to happen while we are going and is to be accomplished by means of baptizing and teaching. He goes on to say, for practical purposes, it is important to note that making disciples is a critically different task than merely winning souls. And this is not an un unimportant distinction because the history of the church shows us that when the Great Commission is defined primarily as going, the tendency is to make converts rather than disciples that resemble Jesus. Misunderstanding the true nature of the Great Commission has led to numerous problems. Easy believism, the misconception that one can be a Christian apart from being a disciple, people who profess Christ but have neither root nor fruit and are weak. So the Greek text clarifies for us that Jesus commissioned his disciples not to merely get people saved, but to labor to make them just like himself. That's challenging, and I learned so much from studying that. Because I'm a go person. Go! Share the gospel wherever you go. But what he's saying is the text, actually, the emphasis is on, yeah, we go, but make disciples. That is the important key thing. So I'm growing as I'm studying, as I was assigned this talk, I've learned so much um, just in my own study. So it seems to me that the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ is twofold. One, to rescue the lost, and two, to mature the found. To rescue the lost and to mature the found. And both these aspects are incorporated into God's plan of discipleship. In Colossians 1 verse 28, Paul says, He, that is Jesus, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone Full and mature in Christ. Full and mature in Christ. That is the purpose of discipleship. That is God's plan for each one of us. And for the church locally and globally. And the same verse in the worldwide English New Testament. I love looking at different paraphrases and translations. Paul's words are interpreted in this way. We tell everyone to be careful to live in the right way. We teach everyone all he needs to know. We do this so that we can bring everyone before God and he will be grown up in the things of Christ. So Paul talks about the importance of teaching. 
But teaching isn't just done with the lips. It's done through our example. So Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So God wants to make us into mature believers. That comes through teaching. But that teaching isn't just through what is spoken about, uh, just opening the Bible. It also comes through people living the life and demonstrating that example before other people. I think I've said from the front before, I'm not a technical guy. I, I, I love, wow, the Bible, paper version of the Bible. And it occurred to me the other day, teaching by example. I do have an electronic Bible on my iPad. Don't feel condemned. I, I use it too. But, you know, there is an advantage in terms of setting an example, having a physical Bible. If you have children or if you have grandchildren or family members that are around you, you could be studying the Bible but using your smartphone. And your children or your grandchildren, they might just be thinking you're scrolling through your emails or your Instagram feeds. But if you have a physical Bible, the fact that they see you reading your Bible and comparing notes in Bible is actually setting an unconscious example that my parent or my, my friend, my relative, my granddad, my grandmom is a spiritual person. It actually sets a good example. So that's not a condemnation. It's just an observation. So use your electronic versions, but don't be ashamed of the old-fashioned Bible because people can see you reading the Bible and it sets a good example. So making it practical. You remember the Great Commission? Go therefore make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all the things I have commanded you. Make it practical. Number one, if you have not been baptized, hey, get baptized. To delay is not to obey. I'll read that again. If you've not been baptized, get baptized. To delay is not to obey. We read in Acts chapter 8 verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Baptism isn't the end of the journey, it's the beginning. And I always see baptism, Christian baptism is like the cutting of the umbilical cord between the mother and the child when it comes out. It's like you're cutting, you're cutting yourself off from your old way of life from the world and you're now saying I'm going to serve Jesus as my master so if you've not been baptized get baptized to delay is not to obey second become uncomfortable in your bible reading what do I mean by that we love our favorite bible texts we love to be encouraged we love to know that we are loved and treasured by our heavenly father and we need to know that, and we need to be reminded of that time and time again. But let's also read the verses of the Bible that make us uncomfortable. Let me give you an example. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Wow! Wow! God's gift of forgiveness. Amazing, fantastic. We need it. But do we underline the verses above it? Isaiah 1, verse 16. God says to his people, Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Then he says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So there's a connection there. 
But let us study the scriptures, the uncomfortable bits. God wants us to be challenged and to change. So become uncomfortable in your Bible reading. Three, find a study buddy. I don't know if I've made up the term. I've never heard anybody use it before, but I use it all the time. Find a study buddy. So we're thinking about discipleship. Get together for a chat and a coffee, but, but add Bible reading and comment and pray together and decide to do something and to respond to the scriptures that you've read. Share your weaknesses. Share your victories. Grow together. Encourage one another. Pray. Who are you going to talk to about Jesus? And report back. So next time you have a coffee, how did it go? How are you getting on? Did you talk to that person? Let's carry on praying. Let's carry on encouraging one another. So find a study buddy. So there's a guy that I meet up with, we have done for years. And we basically come together with a blank sheet. We haven't got an agenda. We will just meet up for a drink. Sometimes we have something to eat. And the Bible always comes out. He has his electronic version. I've got the old-fashioned, or the one that they've recently released, the paper version. And we just, it just happens. We start talking about a theme, and it's often a challenging theme. And we pray together, we encourage one another, and throughout the week we're asking how we're getting on. Study buddy. Get yourself a study buddy. And four, begin at the beginning. Our journey in discipleship. Begin at the beginning. There's no such thing as an expert. We're all growing together. I'm growing. We are growing together. Somebody said once, God does not begin by asking us about our ability, but he asks about our availability. And if we prove our dependability, he will increase our capability. I like that. I'll read that again. God, so think of it um, in the context of discipleship, learning in discipleship, growing in discipleship. God does not begin by asking us about our ability, but about our availability. And if we then prove our dependability, he will increase our capability. And the fifth thing, fifth practical thing we can do, get yourself a red letter edition of the Bible. I don't know if they do the electronic red letter edition, but you have Bibles which when Jesus is speaking, the words are written in right. And you can kind of fast track and get back to what Jesus taught. So immerse yourself in a red letter Bible and uh, learn from what Jesus is saying to us. And in conclusion, I'd like to read Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. In uh, another paraphrase, it was a Bible written for devotional purposes. It's called the Remedy Bible. And in the Remedy Bible, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Then Jesus walked up to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and spread the remedy to the entire world. Teach the people of every nation, immersing their hearts and minds into the character and methods of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to live in harmony with the law of love, the design um, that God's life has built exactly as I have instructed you. And you can be sure that I am always with you all the way through to the very end of the age. Change is uncomfortable. But God is a master of helping us through our uncomfortableness. Um, has anybody seen a plastic, uh, one of them bendy curtain rails? Okay. And if you just hold this bendy curtain rail, you can bend it. But if you let go of one end, it goes ka-ding, and it goes back to being straight again. You can bend the other side, let it go ka-ding, it goes straight again. But somebody said, God's spirit working on the church is like this. This is how he brings about change. 
If you bend that curtain rail that has a hot hair dryer and gradually heat the middle, in time you actually change the shape of the curtain rail and it no longer springs back because it's now taken on a new shape. My prayer in Jesus' name as we, over the next few weeks, we explore the theme of discipleship, I pray and welcome the Holy Spirit to warm our hearts and to mold us in the direction he wants to take us. In the name of Jesus, I say these things. Amen.